And I said that there is essentially one word that kind of encapsulates the Renaissance idea towards language. Anybody remember what that word was? Enrichment. This idea that the language, Molcaster, from what we read of Molcaster, the idea was that English is, is now fully capable of saying anything that needs to be said. It's grown up into its own right. It is a beautiful language, and we read the passage where he says, you know, you know, I favor Italy, but I love England. I favor it, you know, I like Italian, but I love English, blah, 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 okay? And we talked about, you know, how the English language was added to during the Renaissance. You know, the inkhorn terms, the scholarly terms, the overseas terms, all those kinds of things. And the idea was that the language is very fluid. It's very supple. It's able to be added to. And so you have all these different additions going on. So that term enrichment just means this adding to it. Okay? If there's a term, then that kind of correlates with that enrichment in, in um, terms of applying to the restoration in 18th century attitudes towards the English language, it's the opposite. Okay? It's the opposite of enrichment. And it's really, the best term that, to use is ascertainment. Okay? And they meant three different things by ascertainment. First, it's to, turn, to determine what the language is. What are the basics of the language? Okay? Two, to determine the rules of the language. <coughs> this is where we see the beginnings of modern grammar and modern grammar teaching. Okay? And then the third is to fix the language, to stabilize it, uh, seemingly. <coughs> Because, as you're going to see as we go through the notes, and as you'll see in the textbook very clearly, um, one of the ideas of the Restoration in the 18th century was that language change is corruptive. Therefore, if we can stop language from changing, we can stop corruption. Which, in a logical manner, makes sense. But language change throughout history isn't logical in that matter. In that manner. Language change doesn't follow, in other words, the laws of Latin grammar. Okay? Or it doesn't follow the laws of mathematics. And it's just kind of interesting that among the more important grammarians of the 18th century and then later on in the 19th century, we're professors of geometry, not professors of language. Okay? But we'll get to that um, in a few moments. So let's start up at the top. Okay? The restoration in 18th century English. It's a reactionary age, okay? Where rules are what's most important. Okay? Reactionary always, whenever somebody says that word reactionary, what's at the root of it? Reaction to? Usually what comes right before. Okay, it's, a react it's like a knee-jerk reaction. It's a reflex to that. So, what came right before? The Renaissance. And the Renaissance, as I was saying earlier, was open and fluid and was this idea that there are no rules. You just add to the language. Okay? It's Shakespeare. I was just looking at a book the other day. Um, sorry, it's an article where a guy argues, a, a professor at where? University of Texas at Austin, is arguing that Shakespeare is actually the primary author of a play that was first published in the 18th century, 1746. Okay? But the play is known to have probably been around during Shakespeare's day. And this guy has done a linguistic study of the spellings of words, the kinds of words that are used, and all this other kind of stuff. And he argues on the basis of that, that Shakespeare and um, John Middleton 
are the primary authors of this play that is attributed, generally, to this other guy named Louis, his name's spelled Theobald, T-H-E-O-B-A-L-D, it's pronounced Tybald, okay, um, who was an editor of Shakespeare in the 18th century, okay? And he argues on the, one of the reasons he makes his claim is because of the spellings of certain words within the, po within the play are same word spelled two different ways on the same line, okay? That is a feature, according to him, of Shakespeare spelling. Because we do have Shakespeare's handwriting in some handwritten annotations and versions of plays that are not usually in, for example, editions of Shakespeare, because they're not primarily Shakespeare's. They're plays he assisted others on. Where we see him spell the same word two different ways. Well, he spelled his name three different ways. Okay, so that's a that seems to be a feature of his. Um, similarly, he spells words very archaically, probably because he's from Warwickshire. He's not from London. As an example, Shakespeare would spell this word, W-R-A-C-K-E-D, W-R-A-C-K-T. For that, that dental suffix for that past tense on those weak verbs, he almost always uses that T spelling. Okay, that's an older form, late medieval form. Okay. So, a lot of freedom, a lot of variation in orthography during the Renaissance. Well, during the Restoration, there's this idea, we've got to settle the language. We've got to get it kind of codified so that it fits these rules. That leads to our teaching of English in schools today, okay? In terms of, you know, let's say university education, you know, comma splices. You, you write too many papers for an English course, or you write a paper with too many comma splices in, the, in an English course, you're going to get an F on that paper. Shakespeare's day, there weren't comma splices. Samuel Johnson's day in the 1780s, 1770s, there weren't comma splices. Okay? That is part of the modern grammatical teaching. So, what are some of the problems of the restoration that kind of led to this emphasis on rules. Well, the 17th century, I mean, look, look at its beginning and how it almost progresses to the end of it. You start with 1603 and Queen Elizabeth dies. When she dies, very few people in England know who her successor is going to be. She knows, and the Privy Council knows, but that's about it. And King James VI of Scotland comes down and becomes King James I of England. Okay? He initiates the Stuart dynasty, or monarchy. James dies in 1625. His son Charles I becomes king. Charles has a tumultuous reign. He and Parliament are at loggerheads just about the whole time. And really beginning in the 1630s, it breaks out, not quite an open warfare, but it's, I mean, it's, it's like the Republicans and the Democrats today, okay? In the 1640s, however, it does break into open warfare. It's the English Civil War, okay? Between those who support the king and those who support what are called the Puritans. Don't think Puritans like the Quaker Oats guy, you know, Dower and... They're not that way, not these Puritans, okay? That results in 1649, the execution by Parliament of Charles I, okay? This is the first time this happens, I believe, in European history, where a monarch is tried and found guilty by the representatives of the people and loses his head because of it. I mean, he is decapitated beheaded, okay, publicly. That institutes what's called I'll put it over here, the interregnum, which just means Latin, 
between kings, which lasts from 1649 to 1660. It's during the interregnum that you have the period of what's called the Commonwealth, where the wealth is held in common, so to speak. Okay? Oliver Cromwell is the Lord Protector from 1649 to 1658. Cromwell dies, and his son becomes Lord Protector in his stead, which tells you, even though it says it's between kings, they're essentially kings. When it gets passed on from father to son, a rose by any other name is still a rose, okay? But in 1658, Richard Cromwell steps down and invites Charles II to become king. Charles II has been living in France, okay? Charles II is Charles I's son. He becomes king, okay? This is what is called the Restoration, because it's the restoration of the Stuart monarchy. All right? So, Charles II becomes king. He rules for a fairly long time, 1660 until 1685, and then he dies. Okay? This is all under that point one point one, the political problems of the 17th century. Then he dies. His son becomes king. His son is James II. Okay. James II has a very short reign because Parliament in 1688 invites William of Orange and his wife Mary to come and James flees to France. When James flees to France, he gives up the throne. William and Mary become king and queen. One of the reasons James has problems is because he's Catholic. Okay. We talked a little bit about the Catholic Protestant problem during the 16th century. That was still ongoing during the 17th century. Charles I was nominally Protestant. His wife was thoroughgoing Catholic, however. She was the daughter of the King of Spain, if I remember correctly. Okay. So that's part of that problem. It's during this period that the law gets passed in England that no Catholic can rule. A law which, by the way, if I remember correctly, is still on the books. Either that or they just recently, like in the last two or three years, removed it. But I don't think they removed that one. They did remove the law um, when uh, Kate Middleton was pregnant with their first child. They removed the law that said if the firstborn child is not a male, then the firstborn male child will become the heir. So that if... Prince George had been Prince Georgette, mm -hmm. she would have been next in line to the throne after Prince William. Okay? Because now that he has kids, Harry's, you know, he's shunted off, he can do whatever he wants, which he apparently does. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's what I'm talking about when I have, you know, political problems of the 17th century. It's up and down. What does that kind of situation impel people to do or to want stability. You, you, you want things to settle down and let's just have it calm for a while. Okay. One of the things they wanted to settle down and get calm and get straight was the language uh, simultaneously. There was a fear that English was changing too quickly. Look at the quote from Alexander Pope. This is in 1711. This is from his long essay on criticism. If you've never read it, I highly encourage you to um, read it. Read the, seven, the, the writers of the Restoration 18th century. Pope, Dryden, Samuel Johnson, Jonathan Swift. They're fantastic. Sons of their fathers, failing language see, and such as Chaucer is, shall Dryden be. Dryden's just a little bit older than Alexander Pope. Dryden's writing in the 1680s, 1690s. Pope's writing this in 1711, 20 to 30 years later. And, dry, and, and Pope is saying, such as Chaucer is to us now in 1711, okay, 312 years, 311 years after Chaucer's death, he says, that's what Dryden's going to be 
to our sons. He's not talking about 300 years from now. He's talking about 20 years from now. Okay? So Pope is saying in this little quote, we've, we've got to get the language straightened out. We've got to get it fixed. Okay? Linguistic goals of 18th century Englishmen, as I was saying at the beginning. To reduce the language to rules. And you guys are familiar with a lot of the kinds of rules they wanted to reduce it to. And to ascertain a standard of correct usage. Notice what that implies. There is correct usage. That implies there's incorrect language and there's correct language. Okay? For the final, be able to note the difference between enrichment and ascertainment. So, to refine the seeming defects in the language, to refine them means get rid of them, okay? and to permanently fix the language to resist change. English departments around the world are still attempting to do that. Okay? Look at, you know, get on the English department's website and look at the standards for freshman writing and sophomore writing. And you'll hear comments about standards for upper division writing. Every one of you um, is going to have to, I've, I've emailed the person for the directions because I've lost them. Every one of you is going to have to submit your paper in this class to a departmental portal that it's going to get sent to, and then a bunch of people are going to read it. You're going to be read like anonymously, I think. I mean, your names won't have to be on these, etc. It doesn't affect grade, graduation, anything like that. It's for TBR studies to see how effective we are doing our job. Um, but part of what is going on there is this idea of are we teaching the language properly? You know, do you know not to begin a sentence with a conjunction? Do you know not to end a sentence with a preposition? Well, why are we told you can't end a sentence with a preposition? Because it's Latin. Preposition means what? Prepositioned. It comes before a noun. To the store is a prepositional phrase. Okay? To comes before the store. So you should never end a sentence with the word T-O. But that's ridiculous. Because in Latin, the preposition is attached to the word that it comes before. Like ad, A-D, venture, adventure. The ad there is a preposition. It's joined literally to the word. In Latin, you can't separate. Well, in English, we can same thing with, you've probably been told, never split an infinitive. You know, like to drive, to walk, to go, to see. Any verb that begins with to. That's the infinitive form. In Latin, the infinitive is all one word. The greatest split infinitive in the English language, okay, has to be split in order to have the proper... Um, English stress pattern of iambic pentameter. That is the basic default, or iambic, I should say, not necessarily pentameter. To boldly go where... Change it to, to go boldly. It doesn't work. Okay? It's that to boldly go, where the bold is emphasizing the go. Okay? Um... So, to fix the language to resist change. So what happens? Well, on the continent, European countries actually started academies, scholarly groups, okay, to do this very thing with their languages. For example, in Italy, the Acad uh, Academia della Crusca in 1582. 1582. That's over 100 years before Pope wrote his little essay. Okay. They produced a dictionary in 1612. The L'Academie Francaise in 1635. Took them a hundred years 
to produce a dictionary. Okay? The Brits were a little slower in moving towards this academy. 1664, the Royal Society forms a committee to propose an academy. In other words, they propose a committee to propose a committee. Bureaucracy reigns supreme, right? In 1695, Daniel Defoe, yes, he of Robinson Crusoe fame, proposes an academy of 12 nobles, 12 gentlemen, 12 commoners. It's nicely egalitarian that way, okay? Guess what happens to the exploratory committee in 1664? Nothing. Guess what happens with Defoe's proposal? Nothing. How do you know? Because Jonathan Swift is still coming up with a proposal in 1712. And he writes a proposal for correcting, improving, and ascertaining the English tongue. Only thing is, this isn't like Swift's a modest proposal, a satire. He's deadly serious about this. Okay? Not a single one of them ever reaches fruition. Why? Well, the answer I've given there, the inherent conservativeness of language. Okay? The French have tried. The French have been tried for, I mean, generally speaking, roughly 400 years to freeze French. It doesn't work. They have, they might have relaxed a little bit in the last 20 years from when I was taking this as a student. But in the 80s and 70s, they actually banned words. I don't mean, you know, derogatory words. But words like, if I remember correctly, hamburger. Why? To American. So they came up with a French version. Okay. In France, you know, la computer, the computer. They don't have a French version for it. Okay. Keyboard is sorry is essentially the American word. Where did I go? forgot that was connected, um, is essentially the American word. Pretty much all of modern technology that has been invented, which has largely been invented by people in the United States, okay, when it enters into other languages, it enters in the American English form. Okay? Drives the French up the wall. <laughs> that those words enter their language. Okay. What else does that mean, the inherent conservativeness of language? People have been attempting, and we'll talk about this a little bit more next week when we're talking about spelling reform. People have been attempting to reform English spelling oh, since about, I'm trying to remember when Orm was alive, since about 1200, 1230. There was an English monk named Orm in the north of England who attempted a spelling reform. Spelling was very chaotic at that time, but he kind of came up with a nice systematized method of, you know, when a vowel is long, you double it or something like that. Or when you have a long pronunciation of a consonant, you double the consonant, so mm -hmm, kind of a thing. And he does this regularly in his writing. Okay? He wrote a, a very long poem called The Ormulum, which is, if I remember, it's like 20,000 lines. I mean, if you try to read it, it'll kill you. It's so boring and dull. Um, but he did this, okay? Others as well. Bernard Shaw in the 19th, early 20th century came up with a spelling reform. It didn't go anywhere. Noah Webster, okay, came up with a spelling reform. It didn't go anywhere. He got a few little reforms in, which we'll talk about next week. But other than that, no, we still largely spell the language the way it's been spelled for over 500 years. We saw a few innovations as a result of the French okay, in the Middle English period. But that's because so many French words were entering the language at the time. So we see this rise of an English dictionary. Why? Well, as words become more complex, as people become more educated, as reading material becomes more available, you know, you had the um, 
printing press, the advent of the printing press in the 1450s. It comes to England in the 1470s. And then books start becoming available. Well, what happens when these start becoming available? You create a market. You create a market of readers. Because books and pamphlets are available, people want to learn to read to be able to see what is in them. Okay? Now, the dictionary doesn't start full-blown. It starts as glosses and glossaries. And we've got a lot of, for example, Anglo-Saxon manuscripts where there will be a word written in Old English and there will be above the word another word sometimes in Latin, sometimes another word in Old English that means the same thing, okay? Or you'll have a Latin manuscript. In word for word, above the Latin, you'll have an Old English translation. Or, sometimes, just Old English glosses. You'll have a word in Latin, and then you'll have an Old English word. Or there'll be lines written and there will be an underlining under a word and an off to the margin. Underlining and another word. Okay? That's glossing a word or glossaries. Okay? One of the first English, it's not really a dictionary, but kind of qualifies. One of the first English dictionaries is Robert Codry's The Table Alphabetical of Hard Words from 1604. That's exactly what it is, an alphabetical table. You can get on the EEBO um, site via the library, the Early English Books Online, type in Caudry Robert 1604, and you can pull that up and look at it, and what you'll see is starting with the A's, down through the Z's. It's just a listing of difficult words. Okay? Johnson writes his dictionary in 1755. He publishes it in 1755. He starts it in 1742, I think, right around there. It took him 12 or 13 years. Okay? He does this by himself, first of all. Okay? He has a patron, Earl of Rochester, I think, who's worthless. You're going to see what Johnson thinks of his patron when I read his dictionary definition of a patron in a moment. Um, but Johnson tells us in the preface, which I'm going to read several passages of in a, mo in a moment, Johnson tells us what he wanted to do okay, with this dictionary. Okay? The reason we're going to spend some time on it is because Johnson changes dictionaries from the moment this gets published. From the moment this gets published, anybody who creates or writes a dictionary after Samuel Johnson they follow his model. Okay? This is a modern selection. I wish I had a um, facsimile of it because the real Johnson's Dictionary, I could still kick myself because I could have bought a, a um, late 18th century version, like 1895, something like that, 1795, folio, two, vo two volumes, which is about this tall, about that wide, and about that thick, each one. I could have bought it for, I think it was under 100 pounds in 1995, and I didn't. Very short sighted of me. What Johnson does in here is he gives the word, okay, and he gives a definition, and then he'll use a quotation, okay, to show the word in context. And then he'll give us a source for the quotation. For example, one second. Let me move this to over here. Turn that on. Talk again. I'm just pulling one page open. Let me get it.
Coward. Poltron. A wretch whose predominant passion is fear. There was a soldier that vaunted before Julius Caesar of the hurts he'd received in his face. Caesar, knowing him to be a coward, told him you were best take heed next time you run away, how you look back. It's from Francis Bacon, his Apophthegms, page 188. Okay? And he does that all throughout. So, let's start with the preface. And Johnson says, look at the beginning. It's the fate of those who toil at the lower employments of life to be rather driven by the fear of evil than attracted by the prospect of good. To be exposed to censure without hope of praise, to be disgraced by miscarriage or punished for neglect, where success would have been without applause and diligence without reward. Among these unhappy mortals is the writer of dictionary. In other words, damned if you do and damned if you don't. Who mankind have considered not as the people but, people, but the slave of science, the pioneer of liter literature, doomed only to remove rubbish and clear obstructions from the paths of learning and genius. So notice what he's saying is the job of the lexicographer. To remove garbage. Who press forward to conquest and glory, blah, 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 blah. Right? Okay? So, here's what he says is what he wanted to do. When I took the first survey of my undertaking, I found her speech copious without order. Remember we talked about copiousness with the Renaissance? Okay. Energetic without rules. Wherever I turned my view, there was perplexity to be disentangled and confusion to be regulated. Choices to be made out of boundless variety without any established principle of selection. He's saying, uh, you know, I was grasping at straws in the dark. Adulterations were to be detected. Adulteration. What does that mean? Improprieties. Without a settled test of purity. And modes of expression to be rejected or received without the suffrages of any writers of classical <coughs> reputation or acknowledged authority. So he's saying, I had to choose my writers of reputation and authority. He couldn't say, appeal to a Cicero, okay, or a Seneca, or a Plutarch, because we didn't have them, right? Let me skip several passages. That part of my work, on which I expect malignity most frequently to fasten, that is, hatred of people, is the explanation, what we would call the definition, in which I cannot hope to satisfy those who are perhaps not inclined to be pleased. Notice what that little comment within commas means. These are people who are going to be happy anyway, since I have not always been able to satisfy myself. You know, notice what he's saying here. Some of the definitions he's not happy with. In other words, some of the definitions he seems to be suggesting, I'm not entirely positive about, but I gave him my damnedest. Okay? To interpret a language by itself is very different. Excuse me, very difficult. Um, go up here. The rigor of interpretive lexicography requires that the explanation and the word explained should be always reciprocal. That is, it should be easily understood either way. This I've always endeavored, but could not always attain. Words are seldom exactly synonymous. He said that on that previous paragraph that we looked at. A new term was not introduced, but because the former was thought inadequate. Names, therefore, have often many ideas, but few ideas have many names. And what's he getting at? It was necessary to use the proximate word, for the deficiency of single terms can very seldom be supplied by circumlocution. Um, you've probably all, sometime, maybe in grade school or middle school or high school, you had to write something and you had to define words. You know, and you did something like um, refinement. 
the property of being refined. Okay, where you define by using the word itself, doesn't really help, does it? Okay. All the interpretations of words are not written with the same skill or the same happiness. Things equally easy in themselves are not all equally easy to any single mind. Every writer of a long work commits errors. Where there appears neither ambiguity to mislead or nor obscurity to confound him. And in a search like this, many felicities of expression will be casually overlooked. Many convenient parallels will be forgotten, and many particulars will admit improvement from a mind utterly unequal to the whole performance. Johnson is saying here, I'm one person trying to do this whole thing. Right? At some point, I don't remember if it's in the preface, or if it's in another work, he says, you know, he uses this analogy that it takes... 30 Frenchmen, 30 years to produce their English, and it takes one Englishman 13 years. And he says, that's about right. One to three. One Englishman for every three Frenchmen is a pretty fair assumption. So it's something along those lines. A one to 30 is the um, thing. He's deriding the French there. Um, so far have I been from any care to grace my pages with modern decorations. That is, contemporary writers. Contemporary with Johnson that I have studiously endeavored to collect examples and authorities from the writers before the Restoration, before 1660, whose works I regard as the wells of English undefiled. Notice that, undefiled. The idea is that it's become defiled since the Restoration. Okay? <coughs> Thus have I labored to settle the orthography, the spelling, of English words. Even up till Johnson's day, spelling was still somewhat fluid. Okay. To display the analogy, regulate the structures, ascertain the signification of English words, to perform all parts of a faithful lexicographer. But I've not always executed my own scheme or satisfied my own expectations. The work, whatever proofs of diligence and attention may exhibit, is yet capable of many improvements. And the orthography which I recommend is still controvertible. That is, it can be argued, I may be wrong, that homology which I adopt is uncertain and perhaps frequently erroneous. We'll maybe look at a couple. The explanations are sometimes too much contracted and sometimes too much diffused, etc. Okay. Again, he's saying, this is a foundation. Less than 100 years after this, we get the plan for what's called the New Historical Dictionary on, no, the New English Dictionary on Historical Principles, what's commonly called the OED. Okay. It takes over 20 years for the first volume to be produced. It takes over 50 years for A through Z. And almost immediately upon completion of Z, they started the second edition, which didn't finish, if I remember correctly, until the 60s. Right? Um, let's see here. Uh, no, I don't want to talk about that passage. I still never found that one passage that I really wanted to, so we need that one from over here. Let me turn this back to there. <coughs> Put that back over here. Johnson says, Those who have been persuaded to think well of my design require that it should fix our language. It's that term we saw from the beginning of the talk tonight. And put a stop to those alterations which time and change have hitherto been suffered to make in it without opposition. That is, freeze it. With this consequence, I will confess that I flattered myself for a while. That is, when he began the process. 
but now begin to fear that I have indulged expectation which neither reason nor experience can justify. As he's worked on it, he comes to the conclusion the language can't be fixed, meaning stopping error in frozen in time. When we see men grow old and die at a certain time, one after another, from century to century, we laugh at the elixir that promises to prolong life to a thousand years. And with equal justice may the lexicographer be derided, who being able to produce no example of a nation that has preserved their words and phrases from mutability, shall imagine that his dictionary can embalm his language and secure it from corruption and decay, that it is in his power to change sublunary nature. Sublunary means from below the orbit of the moon, subject to change. He's playing on an old medieval conception of the universe that said everything outside the orbit of the moon was permanent, was unchanging. From corruption and decay, or clear the world at once from folly, vanity, and affectation. Now, earlier on, as I noted it for myself, he does make a comment about languages that do freeze the language. Put a mark on it. I thought I did. Yes. He says, um, there are likewise internal causes equally forcible. The language most common, most likely to continue long without alteration. You notice this. The language most likely to continue long without alteration would be that of a nation raised a little and but a little above barbarity, secluded from strangers and totally employed in procuring the conveniences of life, either without books or like some of the Mahatmatan countries, Muslim countries, with very few. Men thus busied and unlearned unlearned, having only such words as common use requires, would perhaps long continue to express the same notions by the same signs. Okay? There are some other examples that might be appropriate. Sanskrit. But what's the problem with Sanskrit? It's dead. Okay? But it didn't change. There is a reason why it didn't change. It was a holy language. Okay? So it was taught in a very archaic form, and it wasn't commonly spoken. It wasn't allowed to be spoken. Only the priests could speak Sanskrit, okay? which is why it didn't change at all. The language of the Quran, some Muslims will say, has not changed at all. Why? Because the language of the Quran supposedly was given directly from Gabriel to Muhammad. The Muhammad just sat there and you know, wrote it down. Okay? So it, can, it properly cannot even be translated into English or any other language. Properly, if you want to read the Quran, you have to read it in the original. Because what happens when you translate from any language to another language? You lose. Okay? So, Johnson comes to understand all this problem that you can't fix a language only after he's nearly done with it. Okay, So let's look at a couple of, oh, I've got a bunch up there. Some of his um, definitions. I wish I'd put them in order. Well, one that I do have, Whig. The political group, the Whigs and the Tories. Johnson was a notorious Tory, supporter of the crown. Whig, the name of a faction. Okay. Faction means subgroup, like people who split hairs. Okay. Um, another one I have. Patron, one who countenances, supports, or protects. 
Commonly, a wretch who supports with insolence and is paid with flattery. Now, that's a dig at his patron. The guy who didn't support him financially in the writing of this um, book. Oat. Johnson took a very famous tour with his biographer, James Boswell, who was Scottish, um, to Scotland and did a tour of the Hebrides Islands, which is recorded in Boswell's journal of the Hebrides tour. It's a very famous walking journey. It's um, very beautiful and all that. I highly encourage you to read it. Johnson writes for the definition of oats. A grain which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. Taking a dig at the Scots. Okay? Notice, no supporting quotation, no source, no etymology. These are some of Johnson's kind of idiosyncratic um, definitions. Let me look up real quickly. Tory. One who adheres to the ancient constitution of the state and the apostolical hierarchy of the Church of England, opposed to a Whig. Remember what a Whig was? A member of a faction. So, you're united to the Church of Christ, instituted by God himself, or you're part of a sliver, you know. And he's got a whole lexicographer. I think it's the one where he just has three words. Lexicographer, a writer of dictionaries, a harmless drudge that busies himself in tracing the original and detailing the signification of words. A harmless drudge. Not many people would consider Samuel Johnson to be harmless. Okay. Back to the notes. And you can read the whole preface there at the um, Bartley website. I, I do encourage you to read it. It's pretty good. Um, Rise of English Grammarians. John Wallace. Notice his occupation. Professor of Geometry at Oxford. The Grammatica Linguae Anglicanae. 1653. Written in Latin. He's writing an English grammar in Latin. Is there something incongruous about that? Okay. Importance of formal, uh, the importance of formal logic and the use of Latin as a standard in grammars. Formal logic applied for mathematics, okay, and the use of Latin, while at the same time ignoring the validity, validity of popular usage. Now, notice Johnson, what did he say he was using as his sources? Those pure, undefiled wells of English usage from prior to 1660, like Francis Bacon and Shakespeare and Milton, Ben Johnson, John Webster, Chaucer even. Okay. For the grammarians, they don't refer to English as it is spoken. Okay, now... The kind of grammarians we're talking about here are primarily, for example, Wallace. These are what are called prescriptive grammarians. They are prescribing rules for the language. This is how you write English. This is how you should speak English, etc. Okay? And there's a difference, you know, 5.3, between prescription, description, and proscription. Most of the grammar you've quote-unquote been taught, grade school on up, is prescriptive. Okay? It's the rules, the do's and don'ts. Descriptive grammarians, however, merely write about and describe what they see. You saw the you see the beginning rise of descriptive grammars in the 1800s, okay? where people are showing how the language is actually used and. It comes about, partly at least, because of the rise of historical linguistics, what this class has been about all semester. 
okay? Describing language change over time. Descriptive grammarians are concerned about rules. They're concerned about how people actually use the language in everyday ordinary situations, okay? Proscription, that's the thou shalt not. Thou shalt not end a sentence with a preposition. Thou shalt not split an infinitive. Thou shalt not start a sentence with a conjunction. Okay? All those kinds of rules. Um, probably the most important one, this thing was still being used in the 19th century in American public schools. Bishop Robert Loth's A Short Introduction to English Grammar, 1762. It doesn't get replaced until one of Webster's books in the United States public schools. It's available online, I'm pretty sure. The whole thing. There's a whole website. It used to be at, I think it's at Bucknell University, um, on grammar and grammar texts. Okay? So, summary of the Restoration in 18th century. Because we can't go any farther than this because that will lead us into... American English, the founding of America, and American dialects, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? It's reactionary. It's reacting against what was perceived okay, by this Augustan and Enlightenment attitude to be this no-holds-barred, just complete freedom of the Renaissance. Okay? Ascertainment. To ascertain where the language has gone wrong, to ascertain the correct usage, and to fix the language, to stop it from being, from changing anymore, okay? Emphasis on rules, again, largely artificial ones, like, you know, what's one of the most important rules that you probably learned as a school kid that comes from logic and mathematics? And not at all from language. Don't never use a double negative. Chaucer uses triple negatives in the Canterbury Tales. Shakespeare uses double negatives. Why do they do it? They're being emphatic. They want to get the idea across very strongly. This is something you don't want to do, or this is something this character didn't do, okay? They're not approaching it from logic that says, well, what do two negatives do? They cancel each other out. That's applying apples to oranges, okay? Completely inappropriate. Yet, that's what happens beginning back with Wallace in 1653. Students are gradually being taught that kind of mentality. So what happens when a student in 1753 <coughs> picks up and reads Chaucer for the first time and reads a line with the, with the triple negative? He starts to think, well, Chaucer wasn't very well educated. Problem with that is Chaucer is probably about the most well-educated individual writing in 1386. Okay. So, emphasis on rules, logic, and the Latin standard over and against popular usage. And that applied to literature as well as, as language. For example, the guy I mentioned earlier, Tybalt. Okay? Um, he didn't like the way Shakespeare ended some of his plays. So he revised them. Okay? Samuel Johnson didn't like the way Shakespeare wrote some of his stuff, so Johnson recommended that some of Shakespeare's plays be altered. Jo Johnson thought Shakespeare punned too much. Okay? Talks about it in his Lives of the Poets. Well, one of the reasons is because this period, which is also called the, the 17th century, it's also called the Augustan Age, okay? it kind of harkened back, it said to the period of Augustan Rome. Why? Because Augustan Rome followed the period of Julius Caesar, which was a period of chaos. See the parallels? 
So you have an emphasis on rule and order and refinement following a period of great upheaval and, tor and um, um, turmoil. Okay. So it's, let's calm things down. Let's follow rules. Let's be all, you know, stayed conservative. As a stayed conservative, I'm saying that, okay? Let's, let's have everybody in their right, proper order and place, including the language. But Johnson comes and writes his dictionary and essentially says in the preface, it ain't going to work. The language is going to change. Okay, Johnson writes that, notice, 1755. Look how close that is to... Pope. It's 44 years later. That's not very long. Pope thought we could, we could freeze the language. And some of these writers and some of these thinkers, when they said fix, they meant like when you fix a photograph. If you've ever developed film, you know, it's not enough to develop the picture. You then have to put it in fixer or you used to at least, and swish it back and forth so that the fixer covers all the emulsion on the photograph. It fixes it so that 20 years later that photograph won't fade or change colors. Same idea was thought here. We can fix the language. It doesn't change. Okay. Look at the difference between 1755 and today. Just, I mean... Simple things like definitions of words, not even to mention grammar. Look at the difference in writing. I mean, read the little bit of Samuel Johnson that I put up on the board. The style of writing compared with today. Okay. All right, we'll stop there, I think, for tonight. Unless you have questions. Pick up things. Well, the paper's still due next week.